You are now tuned in to the Addicted to Success.com podcast, where geniuses, entrepreneurs, and next level game changers share their juicy little secrets on achieving massive success. This is the advice you wish you heard years ago. Be prepared and take note as we expose the realness and the raw of what it takes to be successful on Addicted to Success.com. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Addicted to Success podcast. I'm your host, Joel Brown. And I'm here today with Mr. Get Familiar, familiar. DJ Clinton Sparks. Clinton Sparks has sold over 75 million records around the world. He's worked with Beyonce, Lady Gaga, DJ Snake, Eminem. He's worked with Diddy. He used to DJ for Diddy back in the day. I've known Clinton for damn near 17 years. And to see the way that this guy just continues to climb from success to success is insane. I would love to climb into his mind and pull it apart and share it with you guys today. So Clinton, thank you so much for being here, man. I want to hear all about your new book and let's, uh, let's dive into some interesting stories. Well, well, before we do that, 17 years ago, how did we meet? 17 years. Okay. Okay. So I used to have a a radio show called the stadium music show. This is in Perth, Western Australia on a, a radio station called Groove FM. Yep. And I used to listen to your mixtapes, your Get Familiar mixtapes. Yep. And I introduced uh, your mixtapes and your music to one of the radio show uh, managers and said, you got to get this guy on radio down here in Australia. So yep. I spoke to a lady by the name of Alicia Moulet and she uh, ended up reaching out to you and then we connected you and you, you jumped on and had a slot as well. Yeah. With that, with that reach in Australia, you then flew out to uh, Perth and did a tour around Oz, yeah. and uh, yeah, you and I met in a casino in Perth, and you were, I think you were, you were gambling at the table, you were playing poker. Oh or my something. god, I remember that. Yeah, yeah, I came up to you, man, and we had a chat, and I was asking you about your app that you were going into. You, you had yeah. some involvement in Grand Theft Auto, that that yeah. game, and some other yeah. things going on. Right. And uh, yeah, that's kind of how we kicked off. We had dinner together with a group of us. And yeah. yeah, it was, it was just really cool, man. And, you know, and, and it wasn't like a, you know, a groupie vibe. It was just more like, yeah, yeah. damn, I could see the way that you showed up and it was this like relentless pursuit for success. You, you literally are addicted to success. Uh, I, can I, see. I, am. <laughs> I, I am. It's, it's a gift and a curse. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, man. So I, I want to know what's your driver? Like what's driving behind you? What's your motivation? What's pushing you? I don't know, man. I have an insatiable appetite to work and win. Um, so, and help other people, right? So, and I've always been like that. So, <clears throat> since I was a kid, I think the two things that stuck with me the most was I never wanted to be broke and, and, and hungry again. And I also never wanted anybody to have to feel or go through what I went through. So, um, I do my best to try to help others and uplift other people and show them the blueprint. So, you know, I figure if I, if I can figure out how to win big, then it's my duty. Uh, and it, it also fulfills my desire to want to help other people. So it's funny because throughout my career, when I would always give out free game and I would try to teach people things, and then it would work. And they'd always come back and be like, man, why did you do that? Like, why did you give yourself to me like that? Why were you willing to? And it's almost, it's probably one of the most common things that's happened throughout my career that as odd as they find it that I'll give them game, I found it odd that they found it odd that I was giving them free game. You know what I mean? So like, yeah. I have no problem giving my blueprint to somebody else or showing them how to win because one, just because I helped you and it doesn't mean I'm not going to win anymore. You know what I mean? And I think yeah. a lot of people feel threatened by if I teach everybody else this, then they're going to knock me out the box or like, there's no room for me anymore. But like two things out of that. One, if you're dope, you're always going to be dope, no matter how dope somebody else is. Two, the more people that you make great, they're going to remember that. So now you've built a massive network of people and resources that you can tap into uh, as you continue to, to elevate, becoming even more great. And it's one of the chapters in my book. It's called Mastering Art, Art Standing for Automatic Resourceful Thinking. Uh, so when you build up you know, a massive network of resources and you have issues or you have problems or you need answers, uh, then you just you know, master art, automatic resourceful thinking, man. Damn, I like that. That's such a great breakdown. Mm-hmm. Yeah, when I met you back in the day, I think one of the things I noticed about you, just looking back at it now with my more mature mindset, I guess, is that you, you're playing the infinite game. 
Yeah. You know, it's like you have this grander vision that you, you're always focused on in the way that you create, in the way that you network, in the way that you, you know, connect with others and, and put content out there. And a lot of people aren't playing the infinite game. They're so short minded. They're like, oh, I need to get this deal. I need to like, they hang so much expectation on this one thing. Whereas I can tell you, you see the bigger picture. Have you always been visionary minded or like, how do you view your vision for the future? Yeah. You know, it's funny you say that because, um, no one's ever said it to me like that before, but yes. And I'll, I can give you a story that can show and illustrate that from when I was young. So when I was on the radio in Boston, I finally got on the radio uh, on the big station, Hot 97.7, and I got a radio show. I would go on there and I would just focus on like, how do I make an impact? How do I just be super dope? How do I make people like really get familiar with me, right? And that's in fact when I came up with the tagline, get familiar. Because when I got on the radio, I wanted to have a tagline that was original and unique. And when I got on the radio at the time, Funkmaster Flex was like the number one hip hop DJ in the world. So oh, everybody yeah. wanted to sound like him. They all wanted to drop bombs. And they all wanted, <laughs> you know what I mean? It's going down. And like everybody <laughs> wanted to be just as cool, if not cooler than the artists that they were interviewing, right? So when I got on the radio back then, I would listen to the main DJ on my station because I wasn't the number one guy. Um, and the number one guy on the competition station. Now, we were all friends. And I'm kind of always the guy that, like, keeps everybody cool and friendly with each other. Um, and every time I would listen to them on the radio, they'd always be throwing subliminal shots at each other. And they'd always be saying, yeah, I'm number one in Boston. Yeah, I'm number one in New England. I'm number one in Boston. And I'd listen to them all the time. And I'd think, like, why do they have to say they're number one? Just let the people say you're number one, right? Yeah. So one day I took them out to lunch. And I said, are you guys friends? And they, were like, and they looked at me and each other like, like, why is he asking this? And, I was like, and they were like, yeah, of course. And I was like, then why do you guys always try to shit on each other on the radio? And they're like, oh, no, we don't. No, we don't. I go, yeah, you do. You both sit out there trying to claim the number one spot, which means you're trying to knock the other one out the, out the box. I go, let me give you guys a piece of advice. Well, you guys are sitting there competing for the number one spot in Boston. I'm trying to be the number one in the world. So just yeah. by my goals alone, I'm already beating you guys. And then I'm focusing on just being dope instead of saying I'm dope. And guess what? The streets are saying that I'm number one. You know what I'm saying? So it's like, and then, you know, as time went on, you know, they laughed at me and stuff like that in a, in a, in a brotherly way. Like, ah, oh, fuck you, Clint. And I'm like, <laughs> I'm serious, guys. Watch. You'll see. Right? And then as you just said, if I was stock from then, 20 years ago to now, I've constantly been going up. Like, I've never had a... You know what I mean? Yeah. So, and those guys have. You know, one went all the way down, and then the other one went down for a long time, and I was starting to resurface again years later. But, you know, I didn't say these things to be cocky or pompous. I said it like, guys, let me show you how to just be dope without, you know, worrying about – it's like now with Instagram and everything. Everyone wants to act like they're dope instead of actually being dope. Yeah. Um, you know, and I've always – to answer your question, yeah, I've always seen way bigger of a picture than just, like – now, which is when people ask me, what are my goals or where do I see myself? You know, what's my end goal? or Where do I see myself in five years? It's really hard to answer that because I don't have an end goal. There is no end until I die. You know what I'm saying? So like helping people, there's never no end. You know what I mean? Achieving success is never no end. Securing my family's, you know, financial future, it never ends. You know, defending happy and building happiness around me never ends. So there is no like final goal. There's just steps to continuously elevating to happiness and success. Yeah. You know, what's interesting, man. When I was in the music industry a good 10, 12 years back, it was really, wow. It was such a, like a, a sobering moment to see some of my like high school dream, you know, artists doing their thing in the studio, but to then, you know, growing up off them and seeing them as these superstars and then coming in and working with them and, and finding out, you know, they're on their third or fourth album and they're getting to a point where they're in desperation because they're not hot like they used to be. And they're like, right. I need a hit. I need a hit. Right. And that you could tell like, wow, man, some of these guys have a window of opportunity. It's like they have their shine for three, four years on top of the charts. And then they're, they're struggling after that to try and stay relevant. How have you stayed relevant? What is your focus being to stay right. relevant? Um, well, it's my, my passion and devotion to um, success, really, you know, um, and I don't, like, to be honest, I'm one of those people that 
don't know how, like work is my vacation. You know what I mean? Like I don't, I'm not the type of person that like, oh man, I need a break. I've been working too hard. Like I wake up like super pumped to do more things. Like I actually, it bothers me to be taken away from doing work. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. like I get cranky then when I can't do work. Um, so I just like, look at my ultimate goal in life, you know, an overall goal. It's not like this one like defined goal. But my overall goal is just a continuous goal is to just do dope things and be happy. Um, and, and doing dope things is like, you know, whether it's producing platinum records or it's building companies or it's, you know, teaching people how to invest into different industries or writing a book or whatever it is. Like, I don't see an end. I'm not a one trick pony. You know what I mean? Like, that's one of the things I think I've, I've busted through the glass ceiling of when, you know, there was a time when I was at my peak as a DJ, like, look at, I'm really an entrepreneur disguised as a Grammy nominated multi-platinum producer DJ. You know what I mean? Like I just use those things to get into doors that I wouldn't have been able to get into. Cause I know that people like to be down with the cool and making hit records makes you cool. So when you are cool, people are more welcome to say, Oh yeah, come hang out with us big bankers or us big investors or us big CEOs because they want to just rub shoulders with cool dudes, right? So like when you can do cool shit, you don't have to be at their level of rich or their level of, you know, academically intelligent, graduating from Harvard or Stanford and stuff. They, you have a different superpower than what they have, a power that they could never have. Like you could go to school and learn shit. They can't become cool. You know what I mean? Like they can't learn how to all of a sudden like, make 10 years of music and be working with the biggest artists in the world. Like they, they just can't do it. You know what I mean? So when people like that want to hang out with people like me, it, I then am able to have the conversations that I really want to have. Like, Hey, do you guys know that you're leaving money on the table because you're missing out on this or you're missing out on talking to this demographic or geographically speaking, you're not doing the right thing over here or that. And then when I start like really speaking on that level, I can't tell you how many executives, how many CEOs, have stopped and said this one line to me. Aren't you a DJ? <laughs> and, then I, and then I have to say, yeah, that's one of the things I do. And then like, then what ends up happening is I end up having meetings with them and it turns into something bigger and I end up closing seven figure deals for them. You know yeah. what I mean? Or showing them things that they never thought of or they asked me to speak to their whole office. And it happens all in like, now these past couple of years are really kind of the, the, the becoming of what Clinton Sparks was meant to be, if, if that yeah. makes sense. Because you know me as a, most people that know me know me as a DJ and a producer. They don't yeah. know me, all of the things I've done behind the scenes. They don't know like, you know, DJ Khaled, for instance, when I flew down to meet with him to show him how to market himself outside of Miami, because nobody know, knew him outside of Miami. So it's like, let me show you how to do this. Or when I found a kid named DJ Snake in a, in a basement party in Paris in 2007, he couldn't even speak English, and I signed him. And I introduce him to Little John. And then we sell all these records. You know, I can tell you stories and stories and stories of things that I've been behind that have helped shape and shift the culture that we're a part of today. But you don't know it because I just did it for the good of culture. And I just did it for free. You know what I mean? Like before yeah. like this wave of entrepreneurship or courses or books or gurus. And like I already was that. I just, there was no such thing as funnels then. There was no such thing as like all the things that came around and became kind of the jargon we all speak from SEO. So I, I was a human SEO. You know what I mean? Like, like I told you, I was podcasting early 2000s. You know what I mean? Yeah. Full of thing. You know what I mean? So I just, I'm good at forecasting trends. I'm good at understanding and paying attention to different cultures, uh, what people in industries don't understand about each other and how to make them understand by being able to translate across the board. Yeah. Clinton, how dare you be multidimensional? <laughs> it's funny how that guy's like, well, you're a DJ. As yeah. if you, you can't be all and everything. That's pretty interesting. <laughs> it's funny because, so, you, know, my, you know, my partner's on, on the other line right now finishing up my website, clintonsparks.com, right? And yeah. it's funny because for so many years, I didn't have that because social media, who goes, who goes to websites? You just go to social nice, media. Nice plug. Nice plug, bro. <laughs> yeah, clintonsparks.com. But, um, you know, you go, to, you, go to, you go to social media. Who goes to a website anymore, right? Um, but I built it because um, I realized, like, how much I – it's so funny, man, because, like, 
I don't look at me the way other people look at me, right? I look, I still look at me as like, like a broke dork from Boston that's still just trying to get people familiar, right? I don't look at myself as accomplished. I don't look at myself as like a sound investor or a millionaire or I don't look at myself as that. I wake up every day like I'm still the same kid when I was 19 just trying to get people familiar with me and trying to convince people of dope things that they should be doing or they should be a part of or why this idea I have is so great, this company should use it. You know, and I, that's why I've just now kind of formed into what I, basically I've worked my whole past 20 years to get to today. Um, and what I mean by today is having Get Familiar Inc., which is my marketing agency and consulting agency, having a book and being an author. You know, having, you know, whatever. I don't want to plug too many things, but having let's, all what, the let's, let's break that down, though, because for anyone that's new to you on this, this podcast episode, what are your, like, revenue streams? What are, you, what are the elements within your business so that if anyone's listening, they're like, wow, we really love to, like, look up more on Clinton because I want to learn how he has been able to build what he builds. Because I know your book, which we have here, How to Win Big in the Music Business, you know, you've got it behind you there too. I see it, man. I'm, I'm proud of you, dude, because I know what it takes to write a book. It's, it's, not, it's not exactly the most fun adventure. <laughs> I have <laughs> time. Well to pour you know, it out. What, else, what else is big is Shark Tank's Damon John wrote the foreword. Damon John. All right. Yeah, and, you know, even he said, he goes, man, I wouldn't just write a forward for anybody. Like, the forward that he wrote in there is so complimentary, I couldn't even believe that he sent it to me. Like, wow. it's something you want your dad to say about you. You know, <laughs> <laughs> you know got a like, dude, can you be my dad? Like, what a beautiful, <laughs> beautiful stuff to write about me. Um, but I've known Damon also for, like, 15 years. Yeah. You know what I mean? So when I told him I was writing a book, he's like, I got to write the forward. I was like, really? You'll do that? He's like, what are, you, are you kidding me? You better not have someone else do it. So like, and that goes back to me again, realizing like, I'm worthy of you writing a forward. You know what I mean? Like, it's yeah, almost yeah. like, it's almost like I have, uh, and I want to talk about this for a second, because I think a lot of people uh, suffer from this. And this is a personal thing. Uh, depending how you grew up, you know, the lack of love, or whether you were sexually abused, or you were bullied, or you didn't have a father around, or whatever it is that plays a huge role in what you think about yourself. Um, how you value yourself, uh, where you stand on like uh, your need for love, what kind of love, what kind of love you'll accept. Is it a dysfunctional love, right? And I think that's been a big problem uh, and one of my driving forces of why I, I work so hard because I have that kind of, hey, dad, look, I hit a home run syndrome. So you're always trying to prove that you're worthy to be on the team. Yeah, you know what I mean? So wherever I work, whether it was when I worked at UPS, when I worked at a paper company, when I worked at an esports organization, where I'm working on radio stations, wherever it is, I always try to outwork myself to prove that I'm worthy for you to pay attention to. You know what I mean? And that comes from my lack of love, lack of attention. And, and I don't think I'll ever get rid of that. And, well, I, and I think there's a bunch of other people out there that suffer from that too, but don't understand they suffer from it and don't understand like how big of a role it plays in their life. And some people, I've been able to figure out and use it as a superpower. Other people, you look at it like they never feel valuable and they don't dig down deep down inside and find the value of themselves or their superpower because they're always like, well, this happened to me when I was young or I didn't get this. And it's like, I've learned, you know, many years ago that it's not, it's not your fault. It's not my fault. So why am I going to live the rest of my life holding on to shit that I didn't cause? It is not my fault. And I, so I strip myself of uh, the insecurities. I strip myself of feeling I'm not worthy, right? And it, so I know better now, but I still suffer from the residue of that. And that's why I work so hard. Yeah. Well, and this is good, man. I'm so happy we went there because I've noticed you getting more and more vulnerable in your posts on Instagram. You know, we follow each other and I see it coming up and I'm like, wow, that's Clinton. Cause you're revealing more and more parts of yourself, which also means that you're also accepting those parts of yourself too. Mm -hmm. And that's what it comes down to. You know, we do these interventions at our live events and we coach people through this. There is an element where if you are hiding and avoiding it, you can layer it with what we call overcompensationary success, where it's always looking for that approval. If you're aware that it's there, and you do the forgiveness work, which I know you have because I've seen the, what you've posted in your content. You've worked with the acceptance of forgiveness and you've shared it vulnerably. Then you change the story around it. So it's not looking for the love. 
it, it's just that like now you've got this pattern within you of how you're motivated and inspired to achieve. And it's really cool because you're counteracting it as well with, I'm sure, with gratitude. With well, surrounding well, yourself with good people, right? Where well, you're right. not needing approval from them, but they're just like pouring love into you as well. So you've balanced it out in a way. Yeah, I mean, well, it goes back to what I said earlier, not wanting people to feel what I felt. So once I realize this is what I'm feeling, then I realize other people feel this way too. And then I realize I want to make them feel loved and appreciated. You know, I don't want people to feel that way. I definitely never want to be the cause of it. So if there's something I can do to show people uh, like one of the big things, you know, I talk to a lot of people, man. And, you know, sometimes as I'm freestyling and talking, I'll say something so significantly profound to myself that like I go home and write it down. So yeah. this one time I was talking to this couple that were in turmoil and I could see what was wrong. It's, it's funny because like I can clearly see issues and I can, it's so clear. I can see resolution, right? The trick is, you know, a lot of people can say, I know how to fix this. The trick isn't really fixing it. The trick is being able to understand the people that you're dealing with and how they don't know how to fix it. So that's where the real skill comes in to recognize their deficiencies, right? So I, we were talking and then after we were done talking, she was crying and she's like, oh my God, this conversation changed my life. You know, I'm, I'm going to start this long journey to getting better. And I said, that's your first problem. She said, what? And I go, it's not a long journey to, to healing. It's merely a decision. Yes. You decide right now that I'm not going to hurt anymore. I'm not going to let this affect me anymore. I'm not going to act negative. I'm not going to react in these ways. Just decide right now before you leave this table and your whole life will change. It's not this ongoing years and years of trying to work on yourself. It's a decision. That's it. You know, I see like my dad, for instance, because we've talked about that. Um, I said to him one time, I go, you've been going to therapy for 40 fucking years, man. Like, wow. what, you're still broke? You know what I mean? Like, why are you still going? <laughs> like, you're the same fucking dude. Everything that you were bothered you 40 years ago is bothering you the same way today. You're doing it wrong. You know what I mean? And, like, yeah. and that's what people don't understand. And like, I know how to help people get to the point of understanding their shortcomings, their flaws, how they receive things, how they convey things, how they get stuck in like, people get... People have built these grooves, right? And they're, and they're, react, they're reactionary grooves. So if someone does this, you automatically go that way. If someone does this, you automatically go that way, right? No one ever just jumps on the rough terrain that hasn't built a groove yet. And there's so much beauty to find on that rough terrain where inevitably you'll make the whole thing flat where now like you have so much open area to decide which way I'm going to go with this that you're not stuck in this group of, I'm going to get angry. I'm going to react negatively. I'm going to get mad. I'm going to get sad. It's like, no, now you sit for this thing and you're like, you know what? There's no grooves anymore. I'm going to look at this from a completely different way than I've ever looked at it. And I'm going to react totally different for me. So I can be better at my life. How many people do you know hold on to anger? Hold on to like, being mad at somebody? Or, you know, they want revenge. You know what I mean? Or like, yeah. they're just vindictive. Like, why? If you realize, because a lot of people think that when someone does something mean or rude, that if that was their intention, they don't realize this person might just be fucking broken and they don't know how to act better. You know what I mean? So if, what the minute you don't let somebody take control of your emotions is the minute, the minute you're in charge of your entire life and every single thing in it. So when you decide what kind of person you want to be, there's nothing anyone can say or do that can ever sway you from being that man. If I decide I'm never going to get angry or be vindictive, I don't care if someone shot my kid. Like, that's what I decided the kind of man I'm going to be. And this is how I'm going to handle it. In the most caring, loving, non-self-destructing way there is, if that makes sense. Yeah. No, yeah, it does. Of course, of course, I, I, I agree. And I think a lot of people are living in lower consciousness, you know, at the lower consciousness scale, you have shame and guilt and anger and resentment and blame. They're all very like, even those words, when you hear it, you're like, Oh, it doesn't feel good. Right. Yeah. The goal is to move up the ladder, right. You know, closer to God, which is that prosperity, that abundance, that clarity, mm -hmm. that creation. And 
I, I, look, man, I used to work in the, in the music industry and I'm sure you could probably say too, especially in hip hop, there is a lot of ego. I mean, there's a lot of like, I'll bow to you. There's beef. There's like, you know, I'm better than you. I got more money than you. I, you know, did this to your chick, whatever it may be. And, and a lot of that conversation that goes on can bring us into these lower vibes. And I noticed that it has an impact on society when we listen to music like this and we have like, you know, like dark movies of, of killing and violence and everything else. And to add that on top of people's programs that they've developed from a young childhood, it's, it's pretty tough to have a fighting chance. So somewhere along the line, you worked out like, Hey, this here doesn't work for me. Mm -hmm. And so in that process, it's more than about going, okay, cool. Well, what is it that fires me up and brings me into that higher consciousness? Like, what is it that what stops me from staying in the lower consciousness so that now I become productive in society for you? What was that turning point? Cause obviously you started to get into DJing and producing music. I remember you were even working with Eminem in the basement or yeah. before Eminem was Eminem, right? Yeah. Um, I'll, I'll tell you the moment that I figured out the key to life um, I was like 21 or 22 years old and a few years earlier I had, so my dad wasn't around. Uh, he left when I was like four or five. And then, um, I didn't like when I was 15, my mom sent me to live with him. Cause I was, I was a badass kid. I was getting arrested too much. So my mom was like, you're going with your dad in the suburbs. Uh, so I went to go live with my dad and for the years that I was there with him through high school, there was always this one line he would say that would really trigger me and piss me off. And that line was when I would do something wrong, I'd get in trouble at school. He'd say, I didn't raise you that way. And I used to get pissed off. Cause I'd be like, you didn't fucking raise me. Right. And so we would kind of butt heads over that. And when we were 18, I was 18. We had the big father son fight. Right. And I was just fed up with him saying stuff like that. or taking credit for shit that he didn't do. Right. Um, so I was like, when I grew up, I'm going to be a way better dad than you are. He was like, yeah, you'll see one day the life happens and blah, blah. I was like, fuck you. Fuck you. And I just, I just wrote him off. I was never going to talk to him again for the rest of my life. Um, then a couple of years went by, uh, you know, cause I was resentful and I was angry at him not being around, uh, never came to my sporting events. I was like the only kid I'd, I'd hit a home run and everyone's cheering and I'm the only kid who's got no parent there. So when the game was over, everyone's getting in their cars, their parents going and getting ice cream, and I'm just sitting there on my shitty bike, just riding home by myself, getting jumped by some kids. You know what I mean? Um, so it sucked. And then like, I was sexually abused for many years because my dad wasn't around. So I blamed him not being there for while these things happened. Uh, so, that, so, so it was good riddance when me and him like, stopped talking. Then at about like, 21, 22, started becoming more mature. I thought to myself one day, what is it that happened to my father that didn't allow him to be the man I needed him to be yeah. uh, when he was around? And then when I really dived into that and realized, you know, his father would beat the shit out of him. His mother, like, abused him. He was sent to Vietnam. Like, all of these tragic things that happened in his life, um, that how can a 24-year-old kid, like, handle all that? coming back from Vietnam and having a kid, how now he's a full blown alcoholic when he comes back from Vietnam. So once I realized all the horrific things he had to go through as a kid, I went from feeling anger and resentment to feeling empathy. Um, and that was the day I figured out the key to life. And I went to my father and went and talked to him and I listened and I was open heart with an open mind. And I became, I built me and my father to become best friends. I forgave him. And, you know, even when he would do and say little things, because I realized my dad doesn't have the same set of tools as I have for resolution, right? So I can't be mad that he doesn't have those, right? Um, instead, I'll just use mine to try to keep repairing. So that's what I would do throughout the years. And then we became best friends. You know, I became a man. And, you know, several years later, I had a son. And one time me and him went out to dinner and he pulled over on the side of the road and, you know, he put his hand on my shoulder and I was like, what's wrong? What's up? He goes, I just got to tell you something. And I go, what? And he goes, I just want to tell you you're a better father than I was. So it was like came full circle from that argument when we were 18 years old as the fact that he held on to me saying that 
for so long, right? And then finally owned up to it, like, you are a better father than I was, right? So, you know, we became best friends and then da da but then to back to what I was saying about my dad a few minutes ago, going to therapy for 40 years, like, he isn't all the way right because he can't let go of things, right? So I would try to help him throughout the years. And then just recently, like this year, this past year, like after 20 years of being best friends, we broke up. Uh, so, you know, my dad, my dad can't handle the fact that I was sexually abused. And I watched the Michael Jackson documentary and it kicked up feelings that like I never even knew I had. Right. So I had, I don't know if you've seen it or not, but like the kids are around my age and stuff. And like, whether it happened or not, they said things that were like, I've never heard anybody say these things or these feelings that I had before ever. So I had called my dad to talk to him about it. And, you know, the first night we, we, you know, we talked and, you know, he talked about stuff that happened to him when he was young. And then the next night, cause it was a two part series. Then the next night I watch it. And then these dudes were talking about, yeah, I don't really have a good relationship with my mom because of this. I was like, Oh my God, I've never heard that before. Cause that was my situation. So when I called him to tell him, all of a sudden he was angry at me. I'm like, what's going on? He's like, man, I'm so sick of hearing different sides of this story. And I'm like, what are you talking about? Did mom call you or something? And he goes, uh, yeah, you know, your mother is, and then you and your sister. And I'm like, dad, you're supposed to be my dad and my best friend. Like, whether you believe me or not, right, you're just supposed to be there. You're supposed to say, look, I don't know what happened. All I know is my son needs my help, and I'm going to be here for him. That's all that matters. I'm not taking sides. I don't want to hear sides. If he's hurting, my job and duty as a father and a friend is to just hear him out and console him and be there when he needs me, period. Instead, you know, he said some other shit that was foul that, um, you know, angered me, and then I said some angry stuff back to him. So now he cut me off. He abandoned me for the second time. I like, He literally sent me a text that was like, yeah, I talked to my therapist at the VA. She, she doesn't think it's good for me to be in contact with you anymore. It's too much stress. Take, you and your family take care. Respect my decision. I'm like, what kind of a man does that? You know what I mean? But like, and here I am thinking like, I'm past all the bullshit. Like my whole life has been as successful as I've been and as great as it looks to the world. Like I'm a real human just like everybody else, man. Like I went through fucking mad shit. Most of my life was shit. And I'll deal with like the bad hands and I deal with it accordingly. And I make, as they say, take lemons and make lemonade. I just, I mean, I must've made a fucking zillion fucking batches of lemonade. You know what I'm saying? No complaints. And, you know, I have my new girl, you know, one custody of my son. I have a new daughter. Um, I went through a bad divorce. Um, And then I'm thinking I'm, I'm on the road. I'm writing this book. Everything's great. And then my dad tells me to fuck off again. I'm like, come on, man. <laughs> Jesus, like how many, how many times do you have to go through this like real life traumatic shit? You know what I mean? It's like, does it ever fucking end? Yeah, well, you know, the, the thing is, ultimately, we're the only one that has control over our life. Right. You know, and we, we get to choose how we respond to life. Well, and not control over life. You have control, as you're saying, how you respond, how you react how you receive it, what your feelings do. So that's really the superpower. Does any advice, people ask me for advice all the time. Does one piece of advice, because this piece of advice will help any, how do you think I should make it in the music industry? How do you think I should be an entrepreneur or I'm starting this company or how do da 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 da? None of that shit matters until you figure (laughs) this part out, this part out. The part of being in control of your emotions in defending your happy. And it's a thing, it's one thing that people don't talk about is defending happy. People spend their whole life chasing what they think will make them happy, right? And ignoring the happy things around them because they're chasing this other thing they think is going to make them happy, right? For an example, you have a wife that loves you, does everything great for you. You have kids that love you, want to spend time with you. You're healthy. You have, you know, your bills are paid, da, da, da. But yet your happiness is becoming a famous rapper. And unless that happens, in your mind, you're never as happy as you want to be. And it's like people overlook the beauty and the happiness that's right here, and they don't defend that while they're chasing this happy. So what happens is while you're chasing that happy, this happy goes away. Or you ignore this happy and neglect it, that it now resents you. 
So now chasing a happy that may never happen or a happy that you don't know if it's really going to give you the happy you want. You ignore the happy that you worked hard for in the first place and you didn't defend it. So once, yeah. once you understand these like kind of keys to life, everything else is easy. Do you know what I'm saying? And I, and I know like people say things like, oh, you should be grateful for your health. You should be grateful. And then people kind of take it with a grain of salt like, yeah, 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 but I got to go do this. But it's, it's a real thing, man. It's a real thing. Yeah. Well, it's good. You're practicing this presence, right? It's like being mindful of where you're at. And I think a lot of people are always just so in the future or they're hanging on to the story from the past. They're not present with what they have right in front of them. You know, you have a beautiful wife, you have a beautiful new child you brought into the world, you know? So like, it's a reminder, you know, it's a reminder like, wow, I get to be, you know, part of this, what's going on right now, whether it's good or bad or whatever it may be. And I get to be so grateful for what I have. And that's part of that. I call it mature success, you know, because early 20s, you know, like I, I know like when, even when I met you, it was just my biggest thing was crush it with my radio show, you know, get a, get a, a deal. We got a subsidiary deal under Atlantic Records, flew out to Miami when I was 21. We had this like big high fly life. And then I realized I'm like, this isn't it, you know, and I want to ask you this, man, because I, I, this is good. You're really opening up and I love this do you feel like you've conquered the industry? Like, do you ever have that feeling sometimes where you're like, I've conquered this so much, so it's not fun anymore. And there's other things I want to do now. Like, do you ever get to that point? And if you have, what do you do next? How do you kind of reinvigorate that vision for yourself? Well, the answer is yes, which is why when your original question, how do you stay relevant? How do you keep having so many wins and successes? It's because I don't keep beating a dead horse. For instance, I've been grappling the past year, like, I think I might just never DJ ever again. You know what I'm saying? Because like, why? I've done everything I can do as a DJ. I've made millions of dollars. I've traveled the world. I've worked with the best people. I've had many articles written about me. I've DJed the biggest from Wembley to the Boston Garden. I've went on tour with Diddy. Like, I've found other artists. Like, I've broken many records from Big Shaws to Rick Ross to Akon. It's like, what else do I want to accomplish as a DJ? I did it all. Do you know what I'm saying? It's like, what am I going to one day be a 50-year-old DJ? You know what I mean? Like taking club gigs? You know what I mean? Like, and by the way, there's nothing wrong with that if that's your undying passion. But my, that's, not, that's one of my passions. My passion is to just work and continue to elevate. So even when I was a DJ, my goal was to be the best fucking DJ in the world. It wasn't just to be a DJ. So like, ain't nobody fucking see me when it comes to mixtapes. I'll tell you right now, I'm probably one of the greatest mixtape DJs to ever live, you know, next to Green Lantern. And what I yeah. mean by that is creativity, originality, you know, making like events out of my mixtapes. You yeah, know what I mean? You it's guys like, crushed it. You, yeah, like you no one, nobody it. did what I did in the mixtape world. Do you know what I'm saying? And like then even building the biggest mixtape website in the world, you know, the biggest e-commerce website with mixunit.com. Mixunit. You know what I mean? like, like, and even back then when, when I built that site and I crushed every other site, one, one of my friends who owned the site had to shut down. It was like, man, what am I going to do now? And I was like, bro, you should be an aggregating site that like, gets all videos of like, shootings and stabbings and fightings at all these hip-hop clubs because all these white kids never see that shit. And like, that was the beginning of World Star Hip Hop. So it's like, there's so many things that I've been a part of that like, you look at me as a DJ, not just you, but like somebody... And it's like, you don't know how I've moved culture, how I've moved business, how I've sat with CEOs of some of the biggest companies in the world and gave them advice and never realized how valuable my brain was. Because prior to, you know, most recent years, I didn't realize that the way I thought was unique and special. I thought everybody thought like me. So when people would say to me like, oh my God, like your brain is crazy. And I'm like, I, I would just literally pawn it off like, I don't know what you're talking about. It was, it was an easy thing to think of. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. how did you not think about it? You know what I mean? Like, one of the, I have a line in my book that says, um, uh, well, people would imagine making it. I couldn't imagine not. You know what I mean? It was like, and it was like that mentality, I think, that probably had me win early on in my career because, you know, when you go around the studios and you'll listen to, like, stories of major record executives, everybody has a Clinton Spock story. Right. So anytime you go to an event or a party or a studio session, you're like, man, let me tell you this time, Clint Sparks. And it's like <laughs> the common story I hear from like OGs and artists that are still around is they'll tell you that it was just like, 
the audacity that Clinton had to come in the room or the studio as if he was just as important as anybody in that room and had just as much value or more value to offer and wasn't afraid to offer it. You know what I mean? I think that's was kind of the nucleus of my success as a DJ and a producer early on because I didn't feel like anybody was bigger or better than me in the room. And I don't mean that out of being like pompous or egotistical. I meant it like, we're all just motherfuckers trying to do dope shit. You know what I mean? So like, I know what's dope about me. I also know what's dope about you. Here's the problem. You don't know what's dope about me. And that's what I got to get you familiar with. Because then we're on the same level when we both know the value that we can offer each other. So that's yeah. how I kind of walk in and kind of come in at that angle to make them realize. And one of the things I did, you know, because a lot of people don't have the time to sit and listen and really pay attention to why you're valuable. They need to see things like numbers on your social media or how many records you sold. And then to them, that's a valuable person, right? So when I would, once I talked, they would already know. But what I would do even more is I built my radio shows so I built my own syndicated radio show to kind of go down a region in America that label, labels would send artists to go to these radio stations for the week. So they'd go to Boston, Connecticut, New York, Baltimore. And that. So I made my show. I'd be live in every city every week. So that I'd run into Pharrell in Boston, then I'd run into him in Connecticut, and then in New York. And then by the time you get to New York, you're not your friends. You know what I mean? Like, you know the music industry. You hang out with someone two, three times. That's your boy now. So, yes. like, not only have we become friends from a relationship, but they can see the value that I offer them because, holy shit, this guy's on a gang of radio stations. It would be advantageous for me to be friends with him because I need him to play my music. Yeah. So that's kind of how and there's, a whole, uh, there's a whole chapter in my book about being able to add value to others, which makes it yourself invaluable when you're able to add value to others. I've never went and tried to broker a deal when I never went and asked anybody for a favor unless I could give something of equal or greater value to them by asking for it. Yeah, you know, we could go into, okay, how do you make money in the music industry? And you could say you can make money in this and this and this and this and that, but that's not useful advice because I feel like the principles of what you're sharing is what really needs to be applied. And so many people try and skip the principles, right? They don't want to hear that. They don't want to hear it's about creating value. They, they're like, yeah, yeah, but what's the strategy to get, you know, six figures a year or a million? Like, how, you know, like, it's not, it's never that, man. And it took me even just in my well, own Well, that's part of the strategy. That's the point. That's part yeah. of the strategy. Everybody yeah. wants a shortcut cheat code that, you know, they want to buy schemes, they want to buy plays, they want to buy fake likes and followers <laughs> and comments. And it's like, Bro, like, you're lying to yourself. Like, none of that's real. So, you know, in the, the principles and values in this book, I mean, obviously they're wrapped in music, but they're transferable to any industry, uh, including your personal relationships. But, like, you know, I'll give you an example. Uh, like, this chapter's in here. Like, you know, famous doesn't make you great, but great can make you famous. You know what I mean? I think most people chase fame instead of great. But, but famous doesn't make you great. But great will make you famous. So you're focusing on the wrong thing. Just do great shit. Back to my story yes. about Boston when I was on the radio. I was just great. And the people made me famous. I didn't have to run around saying, I'm famous, I'm famous, I'm famous. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, shit, he must be great because he's famous. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, so you know, stop waiting. Dude, I vibe with that. I vibe with that. You know what I, what I often say is like there's a difference between big and great because big is like lots of likes, lots of followers. Great is getting people results in their life. And, right. and we've got it so warped, man. I don't know what happened along the way. Somewhere along the way, social media screwed us over and I think so many people want significance 100%. 100%. and they lead with that. It's like I need to be known. I need approval. I need to be valid. I need to be relevant instead of going, wait a minute, what's the value I bring to the world? When I was in high school, I remember, because I was a class clown, and, you know, but I was still popular and cool. But I wasn't like the cool, like the cool, good-looking jock was. I had a different cool, right? And I remember somebody said to me, like, how come you never hang out with, like, you know, the cool kids, um, you know, outside of school and stuff like that? And they're like, why do you always joke around and blah, blah, blah? And they, they were just wondering why I made jokes about everything. And I said to them, well, 
would you rather be funny or cool? And they said, I would rather be cool. And I said, well, that's, that's odd. And I'll tell you why. I would rather be funny. And here's the reason why. Cool is not funny. But funny is cool. I go, so you see, I'm doing one thing and killing two things with one action. You're fighting to try to be cool in a world that everyone's trying to fight to be cool in, right? Like, look at Kevin Hart. Look at The Rock. Look at, the, look at all these celebrities that are cool as fuck because they're funny as shit. If they came out just trying to be cool, what the fuck's funny about that? You know what I mean? So it's the same theory of famous will make you great. Famous doesn't make you great, but great can make you famous. Um, yeah. There's another chapter in here. Um, the only thing worse than having no goals is having too many goals. And, and that's another problem with a lot of people. You either get one handful of people that's like, I don't really know what to do or how to do it. Then you got these other people that just fucking tell you 17 things they're doing. And you're like, dude, what are you? Like, who are you? What are you trying to be? Like, I look at your bio and it's just a clusterfuck of fuck. You know what I mean? I don't even know like, <laughs> how I'm supposed to do business with you or who you are or what I'm supposed to be a fan of. And, and that, again, goes back to social media because people think they need to be doing a hundred things to seem like they're cracking or they're worthy to pay attention to, or they're like, I'm an investor, I'm an entrepreneur, I'm a spokesperson, I'm a rapper, I sell you know, ads, I do this, you know, I, got a, I got a cannabis company, I got da 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 It's like, how the fuck are you a 21-year-old dude doing all that successful? You're not. It's yeah. a lie. So right off, the, right off the top, and by the way, I'm not shitting on a 21-year-old kid that's super ambitious and wants to do a bunch of things, but like, get your shit in order because I'm a huge fan of doing multiple things because since you've known me for 17 years, you know I've always done a lot, I've had a lot of output, but it all made sense with each other. Like I said, going back to being a human SEO, everything I did would send you back to something else I was doing. And I was totally conscious of that. I wasn't selling tires over here and pizzas over there and then, you know, fucking having a car wash down the street. Like it all <laughs> made sense. All those things would pull me away from the other thing. When I was on television, producing records, having an urban e-commerce site, doing the biggest clubs in Vegas, you know, you know, getting all these things, they all made sense. And, they all, and I, I talk about it in the book. I talk about how to make sense. If you want to do a bunch of things, I teach you how to make sense of it all and make it all work and help each other uh, to, to grow each business, how they can help one another. Um, yeah. yeah, man, I'm really excited about the book because there's so much stuff that – it's everything I wish I knew or someone told me when I was coming up. And it's literally the formula, the strategies, the tools, everything you need to know, man, to win big in the music business, but also at life. Yeah. I mean, Tony Robbins talks about this. He says it's about compiling decades into days. And right. this is what it is for you. How many years have you been in the, would you say, in the music industry learning these things? How many decades are in that book? 20 years. 20 years, two decades. Okay, Guys, yeah. if you listen to this right now, it would be a no-brainer to grab that book. And, and even if you're not into, let's say you're not in the music industry, but you're in some form of a service-based business or you're a content creator, wherever it may be, there's mm -hmm. gems in that book. I'm oh, getting it. I'm not in the music industry, but I'm getting that book, dude, and I'm going to dissect it. <laughs> I'll start I mean, applying honestly, some things like, and I'll show you. <laughs> honestly, like it really like, I guarantee you when you read this, you're going to call it like, yo, <laughs> this chapter was crazy because yeah. it's really, it's a compiling of like what I've learned, what I know, experiences, stories that I've been through that make the, make the point that I'm getting like more poignant. And I'll give you an example of what I mean by it, right? Um, you know, there's, there's stories of everybody in there from DJ Snake to Mark Wahlberg to Little John to Diddy, you know, to Eminem, Kanye West, like big shit. There's, so many stories, but it's not an autobiography. It's not like, hey, let me show you how cool I am because all these people I have stories with. I'm getting points across, and then I'll give you a point like, I'm sitting at Rick Ross's house, and this happens. Had he did this, it would have worked out, but he made the mistake of this. And that's like kind of what, where these stories come into play. And like, there's too many stories. I mean, dude, I can write 10 books full of stories. You know what I mean? From things that I've been a part of, witness and watch. Like, from, from hip-hop... To, to the Vine audience, to the influencer audience, to now, now it's starting to happen in esports. Like, people go into things without being misinformed and misguided. 
and miseducated. And to your point earlier, when you see a rapper like on top and then flop because he didn't handle his business, he didn't have the right education, he didn't have the right tools, he didn't have the right team, he didn't have the right financial planning, he didn't network, he didn't know how to pivot, he didn't understand sustainability or scalability, none of these things. And you'll yeah. learn them all in this book. And by the way, it's an easy read. Like, look how thin this book is. It's 110 pages. Like, it's an easy read. Man, it's a, it's a, if you just sit down, it's an hour and 45 minute read. But by that's the way, how, that's how old books should be, bro. <laughs> you, get, you get all of this shit in, a hundred, in, a, in an hour and 45 minutes. And I guarantee you, when you read this book, you're going to be like, one, you're going to feel on fire. You're going to be like, yo, I'm going to crush. Two, you're going to have so much more knowledge and education and understanding of what you've been doing wrong and what you. Even in my intro, I talk about, I'm going to teach you how to do more dope shit and less whack shit, right? And that's really what this book does. And by the way, I'm here for the long haul. This isn't just like, by the way, the book is free. So I'm not sitting here pawning off to sell a book. Like, the book is free. I'm giving the game away for free. And by the way, I'm using the same model a lot of people do to, like, bring you to other products and stuff. But they're more, you can learn everything from this. But it's also kind of like, you know, did Jordan stop listening to his coach when he was at the top of his game? Did he stop going to practice? No, even though he was fucking killing it. So this book can help you kill it. But as I go on with my course that has over 65 videos from the experts and every, you want to learn about video directing? I've got Director X. You want to learn about mixing and mastering? I've got five-time Grammy winner Fabian. You want to learn about starting an independent label? I've got Yo Gotti. You want to learn about how to create effective YouTube videos? I've got people like FaZe Rug, who has 15 million subscribers. You know, TikTok videos. i got the head of music strategy at Twitch. Everything you need to know, they're in the course. So, like, it's never going to end. And I'm always going to be putting new modules in. I'm always going to be building new products for people that are part of my community. It's never going to end. I will make you a fucking winner, whether it's in music okay. or it's just in life. I'm going to make you a winner. Yeah, get familiar. I love it. I love it. <laughs> Beautiful, man. So, success, man. <laughs> exactly. So the book's called How to Win Big in the Music Business. Make sure you check it out. Clinton, where can we find the book? And also the uh, cost. Does that come with the book? Is it like an additional thing that they jump into? Yeah, it's, it's separate. It's separate. You know, there's other things in there. By the way, you know, for anyone watching this that's like, oh, I've been to these courses or I've seen all these things before. Like, I've always been the anti, like, scam artist. I've always been the anti, like, full of shit dude, right? So, like, I've seen all these courses. I've seen all the, the funnels. I've seen all the clickbait. I've seen all of the lead magnets, right? And I didn't want to give you a book that was just like, I'm going to give you just enough game you know, like, I give you that game in this book, right? And like I said, if you want to keep going on, you want to get bigger and stronger, there's other things in it. I mean, my products alone that I'm going to be offering within my funnel, those alone, forget even if you don't want the, the, the course, the products alone will change your life, let alone the course with 65 videos. So you can get the, uh, we're starting pre-orders today, actually. Win big in music, uh, dot com. Well, you can just follow me and all my from LinkedIn to Snapchat to Instagram, and Facebook, Twitter. It's at Clinton Sparks. Or you can go to ClintonSparks.com, WinBigInMusic.com. It'll all be there. I'm going to be doing um, physical copies of the book uh, with my autograph uh, signed, collector's edition signed. And you know, I'm going to sell those now. But if you don't want to buy those, you don't give a shit about my my signature, and you don't want it ASAP, you just want a free book. You know, you'll be able to get it, the, the book free plus shipping and handling. I, mean, I can't give you all this 20 years plus pay for your shipping. I did the book. Yeah, yeah, for you, yeah. Right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Awesome, man. I love that so much, dude. Thanks a million. You've been dropping nothing but gems of wisdom throughout this whole interview. I love that you opened up that you weren't vulnerable. I think it was a great opportunity for people to get to know, you know, the man behind the machine and the creation that you've made. It's like, we're all human, man. None of us are perfect. And I love that you showed all sides of you. It's, it's amazing. Right. We don't usually get that on all interviews. So it's, it was really cool to experience that. Gotta, from no, you, you got to get it out of them. You got to get it out yeah, of yeah, them. Yeah, yeah, See, yeah. I'm willing to put my heart on my sleeve, but there's a lot of, I mean, look, at, look I know you got to go. We got one minute left, but I just want to say like, there's a whole world of people that are broken and hurt and they put yeah. on a facade, right? And if you yeah. really want to get the best out of people, it's about relating to them. And it's about yeah. like opening the door up for them to talk, right? So you do a great job at it, man. Like you did it with me. Like you're an awesome dude, man. Like I'm a fan. 
So I'm a fan of Addicted to Success. I'm a fan of you. And I'm a fan of like, you know, the, the, the conferences that you guys put on to help other people and teach other people and invite other people. Like we need more people like you in the world. And I appreciate you for being you as well as having me on here uh, to help, you know, promote my book and help people get familiar. Thank you, bro. I received that. Amazing, man. So yeah. just real quick, bro, parting words of advice, okay? At the end of every interview, we always ask this last question. The question is, if you were to deliver your last 30-second speech to the world, what would that last 30 seconds sound like? Oh, wow. Um, if you can learn anything from me, it's to not hold on to grudges. It's don't stay mad. Um, don't let anybody penetrate your happiness. Don't chase the wrong happiness. And don't be blind to the happiness that is around you. Um, you know, a lot of people want to build a legacy and they want to be famous and they want the world to recognize them. And they don't realize that there's people alive that already look at them as their world. And people ask me all the time, what's my favorite title of everything that I've ever done? And I always tell them, dad. Um, so that's my happiness. And I know that it's there and I'll defend it forever. Find your happiness and be sure to defend it.